Good morning, and welcome to Grace and St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. Well, the frigid temperatures today are keeping us off the lawn for the first time since June, but nothing can prevent us from worshiping our God, the God in whom we live and move and have our being. If you are new to the parish, if you're new to Grace and St. Stephen's, or even if you're just visiting, I encourage you to go to gssepiscopal.org, not right now, after the church service, there you'll find more information about who we are. You have the opportunity there to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. You even have the opportunity there to make your offering if you feel so called. Following our liturgy today, you'll have the opportunity to be together with other members of the parish for Zoom coffee hour. It's an opportunity to be with your friends, to get to know folks better, to maybe even make some new friends. That will begin at 11.30. On Wednesday, we begin the season of Lent in the church, and that means Tuesday is pancake supper time, Shrove Tuesday. Well, this year, because of the pandemic, we can't be together all in the parish hall, but you can still join other members of your church family for a pancake supper on Zoom. Make your own pancakes, show them off to your friends. That's at 5 p.m. on Tuesday. Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We are planning to have services on the lawn at noon and 5.30. We're also planning to have a live stream of the service. We are, though, watching the weather forecast, um, and we will make sure we let you know if anything changes. But I can assure you that we will, as a community, mark the beginning of the Lenten season together. On Fridays in the Lenten season, You'll have the opportunity to walk the way of love with Mother Claire. That begins this Friday. And I encourage you to look at our website and our social media to find out more information about that. The new seasonal journal is out. This is a journal for Lent and Easter. And you can pick it up on the lawn, not today, but next week. But also, you can get it now by uh, clicking the link on our website. You can pull it up right on your own mobile device or your computer, I encourage you to check it out. It is full of excellent, excellent articles. And I thank the wonderful folks in the parish who uh, bring the journal to us. There are so many ways to keep a Holy Lent with Grace and St. Stephen's. I've mentioned some. There are a lot more. And I encourage you to stay tuned to our communication channels, to our social media, to the email, to the website, uh, so that you can know more about what we are doing this Lent as a community. And now I invite you to prepare your heart for worship.
Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, and that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Reading from 2 Kings, chapter 2, beginning in the first verse. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, 
for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here. for The Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord.
A reading from 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, beginning in the third verse. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. The Gospel reading appointed for today is Mark 9, 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, 
one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Here ends the reading. In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. My husband and I have recently been watching The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air again. One thing I've noticed that drives me nuts is the way in which they break the fourth wall. If Jim's glances and shrugs at the camera from the office bother you, be prepared for long, lingering looks from Will Smith when Uncle Phil's lines quote a Fresh Prince song. It's like the director wants to make sure you find them clever, but rather kills the joke as opposed to driving home the point. But the looks at the camera aren't done by other characters. So maybe it's the show's attempt to connect with viewers and remind them whose shenanigans we're following. The shenanigans of Will, the most frustrating person. See, Will does the most maddening things. But without characters making problematic decisions, would you watch the show? Well-behaved high school kids isn't a very catchy title. Bad decisions are what landed Will in Bel Air in the first place. But there's a reason that Fresh Prince follows Will for six seasons. We get to watch him learn and grow and continue to make mistakes and learn and grow some more. But by the end of the show, Will is a more developed person and more mature young man than he was at the beginning. And you're invested in a person whose journey, while not entirely like your own, certainly bears some resemblance to what it's like to grow up. And just when you think you have things figured out, you lose your uncle's car to a pool hall hustler and screw up all over again. Basically, Simon Peter is our fresh prince. He's our way in. He vacillates between appearing to have it all figured out and making us as readers want to pull our hair out with such rapidity that it almost causes whiplash. Ten verses before today's gospel reading, Peter is declaring Jesus to be the Messiah. Twenty verses after today's reading, Peter and the other disciples, in the company of Jesus, who Peter just declared to be the Messiah, are arguing amongst themselves about which of them is the greatest, which is so ironic since Jesus is literally right there. Likewise, in today's reading, Peter manages to have it figured out and still manages to spout terrifying nonsense in the same breath. In our remembering of Peter, we tend to venerate Peter the Evangelist while demonizing Peter the Fool, but we need both of them. One of the things I love about Peter is his willingness to be a fool. Peter is all in. He tries and has varying levels of success and failure and tries again, but you can't argue that his heart isn't in the right place. I think it's okay sometimes to be Peter the fool. Peter who is so terrified that he wants to build dwellings for their visitors. But perhaps Peter is onto something. The word translated as dwelling, skenos, would more accurately be translated as tabernacle. In the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the word skenos is what is used to refer to the tabernacle. Tabernacle and dwelling to English speakers imply two very different things. We typically don't think of a dwelling as something that's movable, but a tabernacle is. It's more like a tent. Anyone can live in a dwelling, but a tabernacle for Jews of Jesus' time is the tent where the Ark of the Covenant is housed. It is a holy place. Even the way in which we as modern Christians use the word tabernacle denotes where we house our reserve sacrament. And it is technically movable. We build them into our spaces, but it wouldn't be prohibitively difficult to move most tabernacles. But most importantly, 
we use the word tabernacle to describe something that houses that which is holy, the real presence of Christ in his body and blood. Simon Peter isn't saying, great, we have some visitors, let's build them houses. He's saying something holy is happening in this place. So we ought to mark it with these holy habitations. The translation into dwelling misses the point by missing the depth of what Peter is declaring. Peter, through his terror, is recognizing the holiness in front of him. Peter, James, and John were probably already on edge going up a mountain alone with Jesus. It isn't an accident that they climbed up a tall mountain where they had a particular experience of the divine. In multiple biblical texts, mountains are where God is met and experienced. In Exodus, to receive the Ten Commandments, Moses climbed Mount Sinai, which was then wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. Mount Zion was a hill upon which the Jerusalem temple once stood, so much so that the two words Zion and Jerusalem became synonymous. So climbing up a mountain with someone who you believe to be the Messiah is setting yourself up for an intense spiritual experience. And when it happens, they are still terrified, which seems to me to be a fair reaction. Peter, in this particular story, is working toward the true purpose of human life, returning to perfect relationship with God. How? By doing the same things that make him so infuriating. Yet while Peter is impulsive and emotional, I much prefer Peter's qualities to one who is calculating and conniving. Peter makes me think of King David. He makes many bad choices, but at the end of the day, he loves the Lord, and that is his and our saving grace. Peter is honest to a fault at times, reminding me of a child who might not have a fully formed filter. He says the quiet parts out loud that most people would keep in their heads. But God wants us to do that in our relationships with him. We are to tell God the quiet parts. Tell God what we are thinking, what we are feeling, what we're afraid of, what makes us angry. Our psalm today says, our God will come and will not keep silence. We are called to give God that same gift. If my spouse is angry or sad or scared, I want him to tell me. Why would our creator not want the same openness and raw honesty? I've heard the argument that God is too big, has too much to worry about for us to bother him with our concerns, which can seem so small in the grand scheme of the universe. But while it's true that God is infinite, we forget that infinity goes both ways. That is, an infinite power must be infinitely little as well as infinitely great. There is nothing too big, but also nothing too small for God. So do not keep silent. Be willing to be open and vulnerable with our creator in his creation. Be willing to make mistakes and try again, knowing that there is infinite grace in our God and that each attempt brings us to more growth, a deeper knowledge, and closer to a perfect relationship with God. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, Grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God, the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night, and turns the shadow of death into the morning. Drive far from us all wrong desires. Incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when night comes, rejoice to give you thanks. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sweet low, sweet child.
prayers of the people for the last Sunday after Epiphany. God will come and will not keep silence. So let us pray. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here in your presence. Open our eyes to your glory. Open our ears to your call. Open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Open our eyes, open our ears. To those who do not know your love and mercy, reveal yourself. Great God, shine your light through us that our lives might witness to your Son, Jesus. Open our eyes, open our ears. Holy One, you have chosen to wear the clouds and meet our forebearers on the mountains. In doing so, you remind us that you created all things good and continue to manifest your glory through those things you have created. Remind us also to honor your creation. Open our eyes, open our ears. O oh God, we thank you for those in our lives who parent us, teach us, and mentor us. Raise strong leaders, O oh God, leaders who follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Open our eyes, open our ears. O oh God, we thank you for those in our lives who are celebrating birthdays this week, and we thank you for the good examples of those celebrating anniversaries. Open our eyes, open our ears. You are a powerful God, ruler of the heavens and earth, and yet you are close enough to hear our humble prayers. Attend to those in harm's way, to those who work for peace, to those who strive for justice and reconciliation. Open our eyes, open our ears. Attend to our loved ones and hear our prayers for those in need for the sick and the suffering, for the oppressed and the alone. Open our eyes, open our ears. God, you are our hope. Trusting in your goodness, we make our song even at the grave. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Care for the dead and comfort the grieving. Open our eyes, open our ears. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.